Welcome everyone to um, our school nurse end of the year webcast for uh, 2021. I don't know about you guys, but this has been a the longest, shortest school year I think I've ever had in history. Um, I am Angie McDonald. I'm the state school nurse consultant for the Kentucky Department of Education, and um, we are broadcasting um, from my bed because I've been hit hard by the Moderna second dose. And so I won't be having my camera on today. Uh, I hate to put you all through that. Um, we're going to uh, have some special guests join us um, here in a moment. And um, we're going to talk about some things about the end of the year. Um, let you guys know that we haven't forgotten about you. That, um, you know, we, we appreciate all the hard work you guys have been doing this school year and how flexible um, you guys have been. Um, I'm going to move right into the agenda and like to welcome our special guest, uh, Dr. Connie White uh, from the Kentucky Department of Public Health. Dr. White, you're muted. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you, Angie. I, I appreciate the introduction and uh, thank you for letting me come today when Angie was talking about this meeting and I, I just said, uh, could I come and just say hello and thank you uh, because I can't begin to say that I understand what you've been going through this year, but I do certainly understand that it has been a huge lift that all of you have had to go through uh, through this whole pandemic year. Everybody's had a lift in their own way, uh, depending on the jobs that they do. Um, I, I wanted you all to know that I, I did 20 years as an OBGYN physician here in, in, uh, in Frankfurt, and many of you probably are former patients of mine. Uh, then I came to the Department for Public Health in 2009 in women's health, but have been very active in the commissioner's office since, since 2011. And, and as scary as it may sound to a whole webcast of nurses, I've actually been the director of nursing for the Kentucky Department for Public Health for the last year and a half. Yeah, it was pretty scary to me too, but we had a, a nurse who had led our team of nurses across the state who uh, had to retire because of some family issues, and uh, I did not want that spot to lose momentum. So uh, continue to work with all of our nurses, have such respect for what you do uh, in your in your jobs. And so we fortunately have a new director of nursing now, which I'm, I'm pleased with, uh, but, but have spent a lot of time in the last two years uh, getting up close and personal, trying to understand uh, what you have, have uh, to encounter in your job. We have uh, Angie, of course, and then we have uh, uh, Michelle uh, Malakot and uh, Jan uh Bright, who's with this team and on the team now, then y'all all know them here at the Department for Public Health. Uh, so we we have a really good team. And since this pandemic struck, uh, we within a few weeks after everyone finally caught their breath, we began to say, how do we partner? Uh, how do we make this work? And one thing that public health does is, is we collaborate because we don't have enough money to do anything. And so we're always trying to find those collaborators who have the very same interests that we do and right now the interest is the, the future of our children uh, and so we began to meet regularly we still meet once a week on Thursdays uh, with the Department of Public Health and Department of Education uh, for an hour going over any uh, up and, and, and hot button issues. But before that, back in the spring is when we started working on the flagship document. Uh, enormous amount of work was put in to, by a lot of people to get that flagship document. And I'm, I'm very proud at how it has held up over time. We have very rarely made a change in that document because it's it's pretty solid. Uh, we changed recently with the, the quarantine because CDC changed things, and and I know Michelle's going to talk about that in a minute. Uh, I have to admit that I know Jim is on the call. I learned more about ventilation than I ever wanted to know in my life. Uh, we have, uh, with all of our calls, we have someone from our environmental program that meets with us regularly to help us answer questions about environmental issues in your schools. Uh, but we've all learned a lot. I have participated in the superintendent's calls since 
April, I believe, as well as our public health folks have also been a part of those calls. So we have really tried to make sure that this has been a collaborative effort. We don't do things without talking with you guys. You guys don't do things without talking with us. I really think that speaking as one voice is what we have tried to do and I think been successful as doing so that our message is not confusing so that everyone knows uh, that the uh, the outcomes of our children and the staff in K through 12 is important. Uh, one of the ways I think the Department Public for Public Health has shown our uh, our level of concern about the uh, K through 12 staff uh, is because we felt that the K through 12 mission was so critical that we did move our nurse, uh, our uh, K through 12 staff up to the front of the line as we started our 1B. And I'm so pleased so many of you were able to get vaccinated. Uh, the people that you work with were able to get vaccinated and as we move forward uh, and now that we're in 1C in most communities if there's someone staff that hasn't gotten vaccinated they can still reach out and see if uh, if they can get vaccinated if they so choose to. Uh, so uh, we are working right now uh, and I'm very close to sending a draft uh, of, of uh, we back and forth drafts, but a draft on end of the year. End of the year is important. Uh, you know, I was in high school once. I know it was back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, but I was in high school. And I know that end of the year events are important. And I'm sure you are getting hammered about this. It's so promising with vaccination, uh, with our new vaccine that just came out uh, yesterday. Uh, the trucks are rolling, bringing, we'll get the, the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. We'll be in Kentucky tomorrow. Uh, so getting people vaccinated, seeing our case numbers go down, that's extremely hopeful. Uh, but I do want to be sure that we understand there are still such things as super spreader events. Uh, in person school with all the mitigation that you're doing with healthy at, at uh, schools is not a super spreader event. So we have to be very careful that we're writing guidance in March that's going to be affecting what's happening in May. Uh, the country is seeing a plateauing. They saw the drop in cases. Now they're seeing a plateauing, and we want to make sure that this is not the uh, the variant strains that are more infective. Uh, are we going to start seeing a bump up? We want to keep seeing those numbers go down. So uh, we're not just going to say, "Oh, it's March the first. Let's all throw our mask away and have a party and run, you know, run wild in the streets." We can't do that. We've made so much progress. We've paid such a price with lives lost, people that have been traumatized by their illnesses, people that are still having symptoms of their illness, even though it's been uh, weeks and months from the, when they were first diagnosed. We don't want to get too cavalier. Uh, so, so we're really going to look at those guidances and make sure that we do something that is rewarding people for the, the great work that everyone's done, but not put us in a position that we end up in a fourth wave. Uh, Kentucky has done well, and we want to continue to keep uh, uh, that momentum going of us continuing to do well. So Angie, I don't know if I've covered everything that we wanted to talk about. Uh, I'm certainly available if anybody's got any questions or chats. I know we do have questions that Michelle is going to address a little bit later, but if there's something specifically to me, I'm, I'm happy to take those questions. I can't stay the whole time uh, because I've got a couple of other things I've got to do this afternoon, but really thank you for allowing me to be here today uh, for this meeting. Thank you so much, Dr. White. And um, if we have questions come through that um, we're not able to answer, we will make sure to reach out to you and then we can get the info out to everyone. You know how to find me, Angie. I do. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone. And now I'd like to introduce uh, my associate commissioner, uh, Robin Kenny. She is um, been working in the trenches with us from day one on our um, COVID response and um, I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you, Angie, and it's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I want to echo some of the remarks of Dr. White and also to give my thanks on behalf of the Office of Finance and Operations, which I lead, as well as the Department of Education as a whole for the good work that our school nurses do each and every day. 
Um, the Office of Finance and Operations hasn't always had health um, within our office. And I will tell you, I have learned so much from um, Angie and other people in our office that do coordinated school health, as well as our school and community nutrition, because all those folks really work together in the Office of Finance and Operations on uh, really thinking about and targeting um, opportunities for both our students and our staff. And we understand that school nurses are a really important part of that process. Um, I think many of us valued our school nurses before the pandemic hit, but certainly I think we can all say that um, your, your efforts and your, the need for school nurses in our public schools are it's very, very important, and it's only been elevated uh, during the pandemic time. So we thank you so much for your efforts. Uh, also wanted to just share with you a little bit about um, the role that Angie plays here on your behalf. She is a wonderful, wonderful advocate for school nurses. Um, Dr. White had shared sort of that Thursday work group meeting that we have each and every Thursday. And Angie is a very um, welcomed and um, ad. Uh, a vocal advocate for you, meaning that um, things that she knows that you all do and do well, she shares with us very regularly. And then also things that she hears concerns or problems that you're experiencing, she shares with that, um, that information with us as well. So I want you to know and be assured that you have a very um, uh, well, you are very well represented at the table when we have discussions about public health and the work that you do on behalf of our students and our staff in public school districts. Um, um, if we can go to the next slide, I'll go right into just a little bit on funding um, and wanted to make our school nurses aware of the funds that are coming to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Um, you may have heard about this through federal appropriations that are coming from Congress. We are actually on round two of some funds that have come to us. We call it uh, ESSER II, which is um, uh, uh, funds that are appropriated to our local school districts. Uh, the allocation is a large number, $928 million that came to Kentucky schools, public schools. And each of your districts have been advised and um, are currently in the planning stages of the use of ESSER II funds. When we got our first batch of funds, we really focused on sort of, we were in the throes of the beginning of the pandemic. And the things that were most important, I'm sure, were just wh where do we buy that PPE? Where do we get our gloves and our masks and our thermometers and the, all the things that we need to try to create a very safe environment for our students and our staff? And now ESSER 2 is kind of turning just a little bit while all that is still very, very important. And we know you need access to that. And the funds are permissible to be expended on those kind of protective and preventative measures. Uh, we're seeing it kind of turn the corner and really looking at um, the mitigation of learning loss that many of our students have experienced because of different instructional modes that have happened um, during the pandemic. So you'll see kind of this turn to that. Uh, the reason I share with you about these funds and that they are available is many of your districts are right now in the process of determining how they plan on expending these dollars. And it's really, really important that our school nurses are at the table for those discussions and that you're expressing to your school leadership and to your district leadership um, the, the needs that you have and needs you see of both your staff and your students. So I want to uh, today encourage you to make sure that your voice is heard and you're at the table when they talk about the available funds. Um, the, the permissible uses are very, very broad, as I've suggested. So it's anything from PPE. It could support social and emotional learning of our students. It could be used for additional um, health or medical um, needs. So want to make sure that you're aware that those funds are out there and that planning purposes are underway in your districts. Um, they can also use this for permissible expenses back to March 13th of 2020. And then they they have um, a little bit longer shelf life than just a year or a school year. So you your districts do have some time to put in thoughtful planning for not only the upcoming summer and what some summer efforts may look like for students and then all the way into the next school year and they are 
actually available for obligation until September 30th of 2023. So want to make sure that um, you are aware of those discussions going on and that you feel very comfortable in participating the, in those discussions because we um, here at KDE would like for you to participate in those discussions with your local school districts. So once again, thank you for all your efforts on behalf of students and staff and we appreciate all that you do for our students. Angie, I'm gonna turn it back over to you now. Thank you, Commissioner Kenny. Um, I'm telling you, this is the lady you wanna work along beside you because she always has your back and she's willing to tread right through the fire with you. And um, I've really, really enjoyed working so uh, closely with her. Okay. Um, this kind of leads into um, our next topic, um, our summer learning programs. As Commissioner Kenny um, said, you know, due to the pandemic and all of our different um, learning challenges that our students have had for the past year, um, we are really um, calling for students to use um, some, take advantage of summer programs. Um, this amount of uh, ESSER II funds, um, a lot of that will be used for summer learning, whether it's um, camps, um, summer school. Um, districts right now are developing all of their plans on how they're going to address learning loss. And, you know, we, we don't want you guys to lose um, focus on the fact that we're going to have kids in the building all in and out probably um, on all of our breaks for a while trying to get caught up. So we definitely want to remember that we have a legal obligation to continue to provide school health services for our students. So um, summer's gonna look a lot different and um, ESSER funds can be used for stipends for, for nurses to cover these, um, these buildings. Um, if you need to employ um, substitute nurses, that, that's an acceptable um, thing as well that you could use ESSER funds for. And I know everybody is exhausted <laughs> and, and the thoughts of having to do summer school may be too much for some nurses to, to do, but we don't want to lose sight that, you know, we still have to provide these care for our kids. So, you know, I challenge you to just sit down and think out of the box about how you can provide those services um, the most efficient way possible. And um, maybe someone would like to, um, I know some school nurses do work second jobs in the summer. So this would be a good opportunity for them. So they would um, possibly have to work a second position. Um, I also want to remind you that um, your medication administration training for the current school year will cover summer learning programs because it's a, just an extension of this school year. So um, then you'll need to retrain, of course, for the next school year. But um, I just want to bring that to your attention. Okay. Legislative updates. I'm really only going to talk about one um, bill at the moment. Um, it's Senate Bill 127. Um, it is a um, stock rescue inhaler bill, and it amends 138.838 to include bronchodilator rescue inhalers as emergency medication to be used to relieve um, asthma symptoms or an asthma attack. Um, this will not be mandatory. Um, it will be, um, schools will be encouraged to keep one in a minimum of two locations like you do your, uh, your EpiPens. Um, but um, it's only if the district can afford to purchase those or can get them donated. Um, it's, it will be a wonderful thing um, if it goes through. This has been heavily backed by the American Lung Association, and I saw that it has passed in the Senate and has moved over to the House um, last, in the last week. So um, it's looking very good that this will uh, probably pass. Um, you also have to realize that you will need to be have emergency protocols in place just like we did for epinephrine and um, those we will have some protocols being developed um, at the state level from public health if this goes into effect but your district will need to develop your own policy 
and procedure to go with that as well. And as soon as we know if this is passed, um, we will, of course, get the word out, out to you. All right. Okay. So moving on to healthy at school updates. Um, really, there's been no update to our flagship document. This is just a reminder that um, there's been no changes made. Um, every, all of our expectations are still still in place. And until um, the CDC you know, were to change its guidance, um, we would, of course, look at that and um, make adjustments as necessary. But um, districts are still expected to follow the Healthy at Schools update. Our um, other like little one page um, supplemental guidance sheets have all been combined into one document that's been indexed and it's called the KDE COVID-19 Guidance 2.0. It has no new guidance in it at all. We've just combined them all to make it easier for users to be able to find things in one location and um, to quickly search for, for what you're looking for but that is linked on our uh, PowerPoint and um, you'll be able to uh, go and view that document in its entirety. This PowerPoint will be posted on our uh, school nurse uh, student health services webpage tomorrow. So you'll be able to get that and a link to this recording, uh, but it'll also be um, on archived on YouTube so you can watch it later or for anyone else who wasn't able to attend today. Okay, I am going to turn things over to uh, my partner in crime at the Department <laughs> of Public Health, to Michelle Ballacote, and she is the uh, public health school nurse consultant, and she's going to talk to you about some changes in um, guidance with and give you some updates from public health. Michelle? All right. Thank you, Angie. And hello to all my, my co-workers out there in Kentucky. I'm so glad to be here today. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a couple of things. One, it's quarantine and then talk a little bit about the vaccines as we move along. So um, we have we have gotten some calls and some emails this week about the quarantine guidance. And I wanted to just review that with you all just so that you're aware as it relates to the vaccine. Um, and, you know, after two weeks have passed after the vaccine, then uh, you do not have to quarantine if you're exposed to someone with COVID for 90 days. And Dr. Stack calls it. Uh, the 11 weeks of miracle, the 11 miracle weeks. So there is an 11 week span in there between. So just to let you know that now, if 14 days has not passed since the second vaccine, then the original quarantine guidance still remains. So it's just basically that simple, uh, which means that um, if you have had the disease of COVID and it's been 10 to 14 days after and you are asymptomatic, you do not have to quarantine for 90 days. All right. Uh, so I do want to talk a little bit too about vaccine confidence versus vaccine hesitancy. And uh, there's a lot of talk right now and we're trying to um, make people understand that when you're talking to your staff about getting the vaccine, we don't want to focus maybe on their hesitancy so much, but try and giving them a little more confidence to go ahead and get the vaccine. So as Dr. White did say, they've opened it up to 1C now, and some of those that may not have gotten it because they were worried or afraid may be able to go ahead and, and get it. So, um, so we kind of turned um, the table on that. And we do have some handouts on that too that maybe we can send out. Uh, I did talk with Sarah Weibel today about um, the the uh, KYIR certificate and as the um, as the recommendations move down and the 16 year olds are going to be able to be vaccinated at some future point, maybe not before fall, but they are. Uh, but the COVID vaccine is not going at this time is not going to be printed on the register on the uh, the immunization certificate. Uh, and the reason for that is because it was never written into the original bill because, of course, this is new. So I think that it has to go back through a review and the bill, uh, the reg has to be altered. So um, I'm not sure how long that'll take. But anyway, I wanted to mention that. We did also have some questions about can the COVID vaccine be mandated? 
And uh, basically the answer is no. And it's because as long as the vaccine has only been approved through the EUA, which is the emergency authorization, um, then it cannot be mandated. So you can encourage, as we said, and give, um, as we talked about, vaccine confidence. But at this point, as long as the approval has been through EA, EUA only, it will not be able to be mandated. Um, and then we talked a little bit, we, I wanted to talk to you a little bit too. We're, we're working on a summer training uh, that will be, of course, totally virtual on the web and uh, pediatric training. You know, we've always done the school health updates in the summer, but right now um, we're just moving a little slower on that than we would like uh, because of all the other issues that we have going on. But we will be letting you all know that the webinars will be available on train and there will also be CEUs and we will give you plenty of notice on that. And they will not be connected to each other. So you won't have to do one and then roll it on into six. Uh, to get your CEUs, we will let each one of those um, those sessions stand be a standalone unit. So um, we will roll those on out as um, as we get those ready. So, all right, and I think that's the end of my part, Angie. Okay, Dr. White, was there anything else you might want to add? Um, doc, I'm not sure if Dr. White is still on, but or this Julie, is Julie yeah, Miracle. Julie. Sure, go ahead, Julie. Hey. Sorry. Um, I don't have camera, so um, this is Julie Miracle. So um, just for, um, just because of the pandemic and everything, um, we are a little behind on childhood immunizations, um, especially in the adolescent um, age group. So I just want to uh, let you aware that if you are getting these children back to school now that we're going back into in-person, um, start looking at those immunization certificates and start to really look at them and get them up to date before we um, end for the school year. Um, really recommend that they go back to their pediatricians and um, providers to get their immunizations up to date, especially before the fall. Um, because we could be vaccinating them for COVID vaccinations. Um, so it would be really good to get them up to date and to really look at um, doing any kind of vaccination clinics and um, anything that we can do to get them up to date. Thank you, Julie. This is Connie. I remembered what I forgot. I'm not really good about doing that. One person that I didn't mention in all of this was at the beginning of, of our working with COVID was uh, Dr. Meserly, who you're going to hear from here in a little bit. Dr. Meserly, who uh, has been a school nurse and has uh, uh, is a parent uh, and is the head of the immunization branch. So she comes at this with a lot of different uh, angles and was also a big part of that team. Uh, and, and thank you, Michelle. I mean, I just think that Y'all should feel really good that between Jan and Michelle and Angie, uh, it's a team that that I bounce everything off of because I know I can have some great ideas, but uh, they hear from you on a regular basis. And uh, I, I think we've got a good system here in Kentucky where your all's opinions are valued. Thank you, Dr. White. Um, Dr. Meserly had a family emergency at the last moment, so she's not going to be able to, to join us today. But um, Julie is available if there are any immunization questions that you would like to submit through our Google form. Um, Samantha, if you, would you be able to put a link to that in um, the chat box, possibly? Yeah, yeah after I present, if you don't. Okay. All right. And, and Jan Bright, do you have anything you'd like to add from your uh, perspective on public health? And so the only addition, and thank you for asking, would be to just remind you as school nurses get approached for your guidance on all kinds of things. And as Michelle has already said, we're really trying to promote folks having a really strong confidence in getting their vaccine and, and, protecting themselves. And one of those populations in your schools where questions come up and we always feel a school nurse is a little hesitant to say the wrong thing is if that teacher who presents herself is pregnant. 
And so I just wanted to give you reinforcement. As always, we refer them back to speak to their personal OBGYN and provider. But the associate or the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists has stated very firmly that the vaccine should not be withheld from pregnant women or women um, who are lactating and nursing. So if they have questions, you can tell them that all the experts who are in that OBGYN world that Dr. White knows so very well have said that this vaccine, even though not studied in that particular population, uh, should not be withheld for that population. So that might help them um, as they go to ask more questions from their personal provider. I keep turning my camera off and taking this earring off and then I turn my, I gotta put the earring back on. I don't go to the mailbox without lipstick or earrings. Um, it's very ironic because as I've been listening, I've been of course looking at email and I just got a CDC toolkit for pregnant and lactating women that the, that they just sent out today. So I am happy to send that to Angie. So you can post a link to that if somebody really wants to get down into the weeds about that. Even though they didn't line up 100 pregnant women and give them all vaccines, there were plenty of women that were in the testing uh, trials that after they got their first shot, it was, as you all know, many of you are women, it was that, oops, how I got pregnant. How did that happen? Uh, I always tried to refrain from explaining to women how that happened because I think they figured out how that happened. But um, uh, so we do have data on women that were pregnant. It just wasn't there was a design study for pregnant women initially. Uh, so I will get that link uh, to uh, Angie uh, so that you'll have that information. If you really get someone who's pressing you on this, it, it's it's a good place for you to go. And, I, and they did work with ACOG and then uh, SMF, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, uh, are, are very are very strong on that. And I and will send that out, Julie. And then the other thing to remind them is they're protecting their their baby when they do this. We have seen that these women who are pregnant and develop symptoms of COVID are at a higher risk for premature births and other outcomes. So ultimately, just giving them the information they need to go ask questions of their primary provider. And I did want to just add one more thing that the guidance is constantly changing. And as Dr. Uh, White will say, we're going to shake our etch a sketch or pivot. So uh, just be um, be alert to updated information. We'll get that out there just as soon as we can. Um, and there's a lots of issues that CDC is looking at, and uh, all of that will be forthcoming, hot off the press, just as soon as we get it. So. Thank you, Dr. White. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, everybody. Um, and Michelle is right. The minute we hear that uh, recommendations have changed and when we make any alterations to our guidance, we will make sure to um, put that on the listserv and on our web pages as well. So just keep your ears and eyes open. And it's, it, it's really interesting because uh, as more data happens, as more data is collected, uh, there are changes. And I get, oh, you don't change things enough. Aren't y'all learning anything to make changes? And then at the same time, I hear people say, y'all are changing stuff all the time. Well, of course we're changing things all the time. The, the more things change, it just shows that the more, uh, the more we learn. I mean, if you think about it, March the 6th, which is Saturday, was the anniversary of our first known case of COVID-19 in Kentucky. Now, I'm sure we had cases before that, but our first reported case that we were aware of was, was March the 6th on a Friday. So if you think about this year, we have diagnosed an illness, we have determined uh, lab testing to get that done. Initially, it was just in our state lab, but then commercial labs. We've learned to collect it in different ways by different mechanisms. Uh, we have learned how it spreads and how we can mitigate against that. Look at your flagship document. A vaccine has been developed. Now we have three, and we have 15% uh, of the state of Kentucky vaccinated against this virus. It has not been a full calendar year yet. So if you feel exhausted, you ought to be. We have done something that's never been done in the history of, of uh, humankind. Uh, so um, 
things are going to keep changing and I think that's great because we just know more. Absolutely. No wonder we're tired <laughs> and all grumpy. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, um, our friends in public health will uh, stay on. I know Dr. White has to um, has to jump off, but um, we will be able to continue to collect any questions that you have, and we'll try our best to address them before the end of the call. Or if not, we'll get back to you. Um, but I'd like to introduce Samantha Engstrom. She is um, our IC health guru here at KDE, and she's going to talk to you guys about end of the year data and data cleanup in campus. Thanks, Angie. Um, so yeah, we're going to take a little pivot away from COVID for a few minutes. Um, so none of these things that I've got listed here, none of these are new reports. They're all things that have been in the system. So if you've been doing this for a while, you've probably encountered some of these. Um, so with this, this is how you keep the data looking good. This is how you make sure your data is what you want it to be, what you expect it to be. So at the top of the list here, we've got the uh, school nurse count, which is a canned report. It's one that um, is just in Infinite Campus. It's not, you can't make changes to it and all this, it's just, it's just in there. And the school nurse count, you think like, well, I don't need to, I don't need to deal with that. I know how many nurses I have. I don't need, it's helpful for us if we have how many nurses are in your district, how many nurses that, because there's a, um, I don't want to say it's a mandate. Angie, what would you like the, we're trying to get a school nurse in every, every yeah, building. There's a, there's a big push um, for the school nurse in every building campaign. And um, this, that we're asked for this data very frequently is how many school nurses that we have in the state, where they are, uh, are you board hired or contracted or whatnot? So this um, data is very useful for the school nurse initiative. So we really, really would like you to yes. um, consider putting it in there. It just takes a minute basically to do it. Um, very and it's simple. very possible it's already in there correctly, but please go and check. because. And then if you see anything wrong, if the count is wrong, if the way people are labeled are wrong, just contact me and let me know and I can help you because we want to make sure we're pulling out the right data. If you think you've got nurses in there and they're not showing up on this report, we, we need to know. So um, as I said, none of the rest of these are really um, uh Let's see, we've got the health condition summary, health office visits, um, which we'll talk about some of these in uh, greater detail, a few immuniza immunization, <clears throat> excuse me, um, reports. And then uh, down at the bottom, we have the uh, state published ad hocs, which if you have dealt with ad hoc before, you already probably know about these. Um, if you haven't, you may need to get access to the state published um, folder in ad hoc. And again, you can you can contact me if you need further information about that. Um, there is going to be a training that I'll talk about here in a little while for uh, ad hocs related to uh, student health. Um, if you want to go ahead, Angie. So again, we talked about the, um, the school nurse counts. Um, so yeah, it's it's very important. I know you think it may may not be, but again, it's very important and. Um, so let's see. Um, yeah, instead of um, navigating all the way through Infinite Campus, it's very useful to use the um, the search campus tools box under the index on the left hand side of Infinite Campus. Instead of if you think, OK, I, I know something of what I'm looking for. I'm looking for medication. You can type in medication. You can type in school nurse and it will come up with a list of things that are related to that and so that way you don't have to remember where everything is because it's hard to remember no matter how many times i've been to looked at all these different reports sometimes i don't remember where they are so um if you want to go ahead okay so the other canned reports um nothing really big to discuss here except for with the health office visit report one thing that um you'll uh, like that that's very important to note with that one is the discharges 
you want to make sure all of your um, all of your health office visits have a discharge. Um, so, and you can go back and clean that up later. It's not something that has to be done when you're doing the health office visit. So you can go back. Um, so yeah, we've got the compliance report for the health screenings, which Angie, do you want to talk about compliance yeah. with all of these? Sure. Um, I, I do want to yeah, really stress the fact that we know you guys um, aren't able to do screenings this year, just like last year. Uh, it's it's COVID. It, it is what it is. Um, if you have screenings, you know, please put them in. But there's not going to be any penalty from KDE or DPH for not being able to complete um, your screenings this year. Yeah. Now, we do want you to go ahead, if you have a student concern, if you can get them referred out, or if they need, um, you know, a vision or something for their IEP or your teacher has concerns, you know, you can do those on a case-by-case -case basis. But um, the National Association of School Nurses and the National Association of State School Nurse Consultants are both agreeing that mass screenings, it's just not still not safe to perform those in school setting. So, um, so don't worry about not having completed them. Yeah, and it'll probably say non-compliant, but again, that's not, yeah, yeah we're not checking that. Um, you can go ahead and move forward, Angie. Um, so I, I mentioned this earlier with one of the other, um, or no, this is the health office visit. Um, this is one of the, um, this is an ad hoc that is ju it just pulls missing discharges. So you can run this and anybody that comes up there is missing a discharge. And yeah, you can just go clean it up. And the best way, um, it's a little kind of a tip or a trick, I guess, with um, ad hoc is that when you go and you've got your um, filter highlighted as it is in this box here, you can go click the little search box down in the left side, so excuse me, left hand side and the student list will populate um, under the index and you can just click through kid after kid instead of searching for a kid, going back to the ad hoc, searching for a kid, go, fixing them. You can just go right through, straight through and fix them right there. So it's a lot easier that way. You wanna advance the slide? Um, so I'm not telling you anything you don't know about the top nine uh, chronic health conditions. These are the ones that we do um, we do pull a report for this at the end of the year. So just make sure everything is in there looking good. Um, that's really all there is to say about that. Just, just check it. Most of these, you shouldn't have to go in and do a lot of work. They should just be a quick check probably. Um, if you have a big issue, again, just contact me. I, I can help you. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so this is again about the exams. These are two um, ad hocs that are in there for you. And again, just run them. And if you've never run an ad hoc before, which I know some people, it's very intimidating. Um, ad hoc is, it doesn't matter who you are. It can be intimidating. And so if you've never run it before, you can't break anything. You can't change any data from doing it. So just go in there and run it um, just from the, the little breadcrumb thing that's on there, uh, the ad hoc reporting filter designer stay, you know, this is how you find these, these reports. They're all in the state published folder. So next slide, please. Angie. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, so we've got immunization certificates. Again, you're just, you're just going to click this, just run it and see if um, if everything is the way it's supposed to be. Um, and these are not as easily changed as some of them because um, or this but the, the, the second one on this list, it's a different kind of uh, it's a different kind of report. All the rest of these, you can make a copy and edit and it's really easy to change missing discharges from this one month or a specific you can add the nurse that is on that should be um doing the discharges and you you can you can 
dig into your data a lot more if you want to edit things, but something like the hep A vaccine, the missing hep A vaccine, you can't just dig into that data again. You can contact me and we can see what we can do, but you probably don't need to dig deeper on that. That's probably the, that's probably all you'll need for that. Um, if you want to advance. Okay. Um, this is what I had brought up earlier. Um, I was going to go deeper into a lot of ad hoc stuff for this meeting, and I thought this isn't really the place to do it. It needs to be more of a, a group, like people can talk to me, I can talk to everybody. It's not, ad hoc is not something that can just be shown. It has to be like hands-on working with it. So um, if you work with school health and you're interested in ad hoc, if you've done ad hoc before and you're, you want to just make your reports look nicer, if you are just, just have no idea what I'm saying when I'm talking about ad hocs, um, this might be for you. So if you want to go ahead and sign up, it'll be March 16th from two to four. If, if anybody's interested. <laughs> and she'll also be able to help you with any other health yes. questions that you have. Yeah. Anything you're that not you sure want, how to, yeah. Set up a set up a treatment or how to schedule, you know, office visits, that sort of thing. This is this would be the perfect time. Yeah. Yeah. All of that stuff. It's it's harder to do it when you're just being shown a, a PowerPoint and just giving bullet points. It's easier if you can go and ask questions and and get in and work on it while we're doing it. So it's, it's just easier that way. So you can. Is that OK? <laughs> Thanks. <All right. laughs> Thanks, Sam. Um, I've been asked to pass this um, along on uh, behalf of Pat Glass that um, the Kentucky School Nurse Summer Conference is going to be held July 12th, 13th, and 14th. Um, they will be sending a survey out on the listserv very soon regarding uh, whether you would prefer in-person or virtual option. Um, it, it doesn't look like probably that it will be be in person just because you know with the, our travel restrictions and whatnot but um that's still kind of in in the planning stages if you have any questions about it you send them to sheila estes our ksna president and the agenda and registration information will be released on the listserv around the second week of march so if you have any um, keep your eyes out for that. Okay. And Angie, I wanted to just enter. Inter, I want to just interject here real quick um, for all of as the new nurses come on board at the districts, if you could try and get them on the list serve, that's the way that we communicate and it's very simple. So um, we, you know, we're, we're trying to make that a central hub of information uh, and it would just be a great idea if we could see more members on there. Thanks. Yes. With all the turnover, it's nearly impossible for us to keep a running list of, of active email addresses and stuff to send things out to you. So the listserv is our best way to get in touch with you guys. So if you're not a, a member, I would um, encourage you to do so. Hi, hey, and I'm going to turn it over um, quickly to uh, Mr. Jim Tackett. He's going to give you guys an um, update on some efforts by the coordinated school health team. Thanks, Angie. Um, just a few things that we would like to, to share with you all this afternoon uh, as our uh, Kentucky Healthy Schools team with staff, both at uh, Department of Education and Department for Public Health. Um, one is a thank you to um, several of you who answered our request in providing us some uh, information in regards to a recent survey uh, in regards to uh, what professional development would be helpful during this time frame and or technical assistance. Uh, and we had nearly 130 of you that, that responded to us um, as we began uh, looking to the near future. Um, and a majority of you um, uh, highlighted uh, best practices around COVID as it relates to student mental health, as well as um, student health in general. 
Um, so we will be uh, looking further into that. Uh, we'll be scheduling some additional uh, PD uh, and technical assistance around those needs. Uh, but if you have specific needs or questions uh, that our team can help with, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And um, you can also reach out to Angie and she can make that connection as well. So thanks again for those of you that were able to respond to that. Secondly is a, another opportunity for professional development um, that is being coordinated by the Tennessee Department of Education, the Colorado Department of Education, and NASNN. Um, and this is again around um, uh, assistance related to COVID and how we're moving forward. Um, the, this will occur beginning next week. So these will be an hour and 15 minute sessions beginning on Monday the 8th and running through um, Thursday the 11th um, from 2 to 3.15 Central Time, 3 to 4.15 Eastern. Um, you also are able to receive by participating in all four of these sessions, you'll be able to receive uh, five um, uh, free CNEs um, if you complete the whole series of that. I will put um, um, the registration link in the chat. Uh, so if you're interested, um, you're more than welcome to go ahead and register. Uh, deadline to register for the first session will be uh, Wednesday, this Wednesday. So I would encourage you to go ahead and, and get registered if you're interested. Um, you will actually register by clicking on the top right hand corner of the, um, of the link and you will have to register for each session uh, individually uh, for that. For those of you who may not be able to participate during those times but are interested, they will be archived and it's our understanding that um, those resources and those uh, CNEs will also be available um, if you're able to watch those via archive. So if you have more questions on that, uh, let us know and we're, we're happy to, to answer those and, and point you in that direction. And then finally, a resource that came out on Friday on the uh, Kentucky Health Coordinator listserv, um, but related to tobacco and vaping. So some of you may have interest in this um, and may be getting requests. Um, this is a program I can end the trend, which is uh, being coordinated and, and led by um, folks at UK. Uh, so UK students actually talk to middle elementary, middle, and high school students about the dangers of smoking and vaping, as well as uh, big tobacco marketing. So if you're interested in that, I will also put a link in uh, the chat um, so you can reach out to um, UK folks in regards to that. So Angie, that is all I have uh, from our, our end. Thank you, Jim. All right. I'm gonna we're moving right along, so um, we'll be able to give you some of your time back today, which is awesome. Um, I'm going to move into the question and answer portion um, with any of our questions that were submitted on our Google form. I will um, let Sam read those off, and then anyone from the team is welcome to um, um, respond. Okay, first question. Do you anticipate that we will be able to discontinue staff slash student daily temperature checks in the near future? Uh, I can get that one, Angie. Uh, the, um, the guidance is changing on a daily basis, so we are looking for that. It's not happened yet. It may not happen, but as we said before, we're ready to pivot and send you out information just as soon as we get it. So at this point, the answer is no. Uh, and we'll just leave it at that, but there's more to come. Okay. Um, do we know if there will be any changes to the safety e expectations of six feet social distancing? Uh, Angie, I asked Dr. White about that one too, if you want me to jump on. Sure, uh, sure. She just said the, the space is still, and she went like this, six feet. So we know that's the biggest obstacle that you all have got right now. If you will look in the Healthy at Schools document, it says six feet or as close to that as you can get. And we'll just let you interpret that as you go, as you can read the guidance yourself. But she literally did this and she said six feet. 
so. Okay. Just remember, these kids haven't been vaccinated. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's a great point. Um, okay. When a student has immunizations flagged because it was given a few days before the time it's due, how can we correct? How can we correct it so it will not flag in the system? Okay, that system is built so that if the the date is not correct and given within the four day window, it will flag and you can't change it until they get revaccinated and you enter the new date. Okay, yeah. you can't change and, that. Yeah, and remember, as far as uh, KDE is concerned, we do not look at individual um, immunization compliance. Now we know how important it is, and but that's you know public health area. If you're worried about your infinite campus report looking bad. That's not something that we look at. But if you do get something non-compliant, look at it and see why. And I think right. Julie will, will support me on that. Right. That it's a four-day window, and most if it's given five days before it's due, then it's going to be non-compliant, and the child really is non-compliant for that vaccine at the time. Okay. Are students still required to be forward-facing in the classrooms? Yeah, none of that guidance has changed. And it has so changed. Currently, yes. Yeah. Okay. Are there now, new guidelines of oh, how sorry, much? Samantha. I was going to say that Dr. White said that we would look at it as a team, that whole guy, that whole um, Healthy at Schools document. Nothing will change. Am I right, Angie? And intercede here if you can, if you need to, mm -hmm. before the next school year. So as of right now, we don't, we don't anticipate. Do we, Angie, any no. change to that? No. Hmm. Okay. Um, are there new guidelines of how many students you may have on a school bus? No, that's not no, changed. Not changed. Either. Yeah. yeah. They just need to follow the, um, you know, the guidance as far as how to, to load and unload and students should be wearing masks unless medically waived. And also the other big thing about the bus is the seating okay. chart. Because right. when you do an investigation, you're going to want to know who's in front, who's on the sides, and who's in the back. So that's the most one of the most important pieces, especially if there's a lot of kids on the bus. Okay, with the return of all students five days a week, what is recommended as far as the sharing of manipulatives, PE equipment, classroom materials, laptop computers, et cetera? Uh, Angie, I could you can enter you can chime in here, but we asked Dr. White about this before the session started. She said it's not a big risk for COVID to be on the fomites or if you you know not live things. So the main thing is to have the kids wash their hands coming and going. Yeah. So get the germs use off that the hand them. sanitizer. Yep. Yeah. Use that hand get sanitizer. Get the germs off the kids. Don't worry about the you know the hula hoop. <laughs> Just and Samantha, if they refer to those healthy guidelines or sanitation and different yeah. guidelines that came from the environmental department for all of those responses. Okay. Yeah. And it's after school, just a normal cleaning. So, but Dr. White did, we did ask her that before we started today. Um, that's all the questions that we have. So. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And somebody asked about um, whether they could play on the slide and the jungle gyms and stuff. And, you know, they don't have to be clean between 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 students. Um, I mean, granted, you don't want 30 kids all piled up on the same monkey bars at the same time. Um, you know, you need to try to space out the kids, but there's no uh, contraindication about not being able to use um, playground equipment. Yeah, but then just to wash their hands when they come in yes. from playing. Yeah. That's right. Wash hands, wash hands. Okay, well, it looks like we um, got through this in record time. Um, <laughs> if you have questions that come up later, feel free to email um, me, Michelle, myself. Um, we'll be happy to answer those for you. Um, check back on our um, KDE Student Health Services COVID-19 page tomorrow. I will have um, our PowerPoint and our, the resources that um, Jim shared, we'll have all that in the article from Dr. that Dr. White had. I'll get all those things posted um, tomorrow. It may be afternoon because it takes a little time once we post it for it to process to the webpage. Um, you'll also be able to go back and watch 
this recording on YouTube or our KDE Media Portal. And you feel free to share it with anyone that um, may have questions or concerns. And um, I just want to tell you guys again how proud I am of each and every one of you and all the hard work that you guys have, have done over this past year. And it's just nothing short of amazing. It, it just, I'm humbled to be able to, to serve, to serve you and to try to my best to advocate for you and, and your kids. Um, also want to say, God bless all you guys that are dealing with the floods right now. Um, I see, all the videos from my um, old neck of the woods in Casey County, and it just breaks my heart of all the flooding and um, loss of property. And, and you know, I'm sure a lot of you played on going back to school today and probably wasn't able to do so because of the, because of the flood. So um, hang in there. Um, we love you all. And um, I hope everyone has a great rest of the day and, if you haven't gotten your shot yet, please go do it. Please go do it and encourage everyone you love to do it as well. So thank you. And thank you for tuning in. We'll be talking to you soon. Thank you all. It was good to Thanks. see you.